You're listening to the Stoic Solutions Podcast, practical wisdom for everyday life inspired by the ancient tradition of Stoic philosophy from Greece and Rome. I'm your host, Justin Vakula. Visit my website at stoicsolutionspodcast.com. This is episode 106, Soul in the Game, The Art of a Meaningful Life. I speak with author Vitaly Katzenelson about topics in his book, including applications of Stoic philosophy, the benefits of a frugal life, finding fulfillment, and mindfulness. Vitaly Katzenelson was born in Murmansk, USSR, and immigrated to the United States with his family in 1991. After joining Denver-based value investment firm IMA in 1997, Vitaly became chief investment officer in 2007 and CEO in 2012. Vitaly has written two books on investing, and he is an award-winning writer. Known for his uncommon common sense, Forbes magazine called him the new Benjamin Graham. Soul in the Game is a book of inspiring stories and hard-won lessons on how to live a meaningful life, crafted by investor and writer Vitaly Katzenelson. Drawing from the lives of classical composers, ancient Stoic philosophers, and contemporary thinkers, Katzenelson weaves together a tapestry of practical wisdom that has helped him overcome his greatest challenges in work, family, identity, and health, and in dealing with success, failure, and more. Find more information in the show notes. On with today's episode. All right. Thank you for joining me today. My pleasure. All right. And I am here today to discuss your book, Soul in the Game, The Art of a Meaningful Life. Can you give listeners a quick elevator pitch for the book? Well, this is my third book. My first two books uh, were about investing. So this is this is a book about life, right? And in this, this book, I discuss a variety of topics from... There's a little bit autobiographical elements in it, but there's I also talk about parenting, classical music, creativity. There was a one third of the book is dedicated dedicated to Stoic philosophy. So uh, it's a basically just think of it, but maybe maybe this this is the way to look at this book. It's you just it's a collection of essays where you and maybe you can maybe you you know you can just you know you you can tell your impression of this, but it's just basically the way I wrote it. I wanted my readers just to read one essay at a time. Just read an essay or two and think about it. That's how kind of that's how I wrote that book. Yes, and you talk about direct applications of stoicism that you found that you've applied to parenting, taking on challenges and so much more. Yes, no, I think the uh, I'm um, I'm taking the Zeno's approach. Uh, I think it was Zeno when he was coach uh, he was quoting Zeno when he said when, he, when Zeno was talking to his students, he said, I'm not talking to you as if, as, as it was a doctor talking to his patients. I'm talking to you, I'm just talking to you as one patient talking to another and sharing his, you know, uh, his journey. So kind of, uh, kind of move your, your bed closer to mine and let's talk about stoicism kind of thing. So that's how I approached this whole book. And how did you find stoicism? So I heard a lot about stoicism in the past. And then I stumbled on the Academy of Control. And to me, that was an eye-opening kind of, this was an aha moment. This is when I realized there's something special about this. Because before, before this, I had all the evil preconceived notions about stoicism that, you know, this is about not feeling. This is a, when I stumbled on the Academy of Control, it really piqued my interest. So I started to read more and more about it and I realized what stoicism, stoicism really is, it's an operating system for life. Because what happens to us when we are born, uh, we come with hardware and software. And that's kind of the software, the operating system, the software is fairly blank. And then it's kind of written into us how we behave in a very random way, if we're lucky, we have good parents and they teach us how to behave. If we have good friends, they will help us. If you have read, if you read good books, that will influence us and so on. But all of this is almost like a Frankenstein kind of operating system where it comes from different parts. Um, uh, and we may or may not be lucky to get the right operating system. Uh, Stoic philosophy is this kind of secular operating system that you can go through life if you apply it. You know, knowing is not good enough. If you apply it to your life, 
I think it's basically what it can do. It can reduce the volatility of negative emotions in your life. And you make your life basically kind of reducing all the negative stuff. And by doing that, your life will be pleasurable is not the right word, but uh, less stressful, I guess. Yes, a lot of lessons to be learned from Stoicism that we'll talk about in this episode. And it's an interesting thing because the philosophers of old have reflected on human nature and a lot of the challenges that they wrote about happen to be mm-hmm. lots of the same that we have today, even though so many things have changed, so many things have also remained the same. I remember reading Seneca's, in one of his books, Seneca was complaining how people are unfocused, how they waste their time. And like, if you read it, you would feel like this is written like two years ago, (laughs) right? But because, but you know, because, you know, now we have Facebook, Instagram, we have instant messages, all the different things, right? But he was writing about how people, uh, how people were wasting their time, how they were spending things on frivolous, frivolous activities 2,000 years ago. And this is when you realize, yes, this philosophy is 2,000 years old. And maybe, yes, and now we have computers and we have all this technology, etc. But human nature hasn't really changed. This is why this, you know, the kind of the stoic philosophy is so fascinating because it's as a, important now as it was 2,000 years ago. Yes, yeah, Seneca, Epictetus, Marcus Aurelius, you mentioned in your book, they, they talk about thinking ahead to the future, not living every day with dread, but having an acceptance about what may happen, that life is short, we're going to lose loved ones, circumstances are going to change in the way that we don't like. So you talk about this idea of negative visualization to help us prepare for calamities in life that the Stoics tell us will happen. These things are inevitable. So can you talk about how you think about negative visualization and what are the benefits of that? One way is to prepare to bad things happen to you in the future. And so when you face, you know, when you face that future, it's not going to sting as much. When I I, I run an investment firm and um, I remember this is a long time ago and this is even before I knew how to spell Stoics. Um, I, we had a client that came to us and uh, he, um, you know, we are long-term investors. So we buy stocks, we own them for years and years and years, right? So when I buy a company, I have no idea what the stock price is going to be three months from now, six months from now. And remember this client, he came to us, and when we talked to him on the phone, he sounded like he's buying completely into our investment philosophy. And at the time, my firm was very small, and that client was very large in relation to the size of the firm. And maybe two weeks or three weeks into our relationship, I started to notice that he's actually questioning every decision I'm making. And his time horizon is in days, not years like mine. This is when I realized, uh, well, if this happened today, I would have probably talked to him and said, maybe we should part. But at the time, I could not afford to do this. So what I did, I basically assumed mentally that this client will be gone. And this way, I would, my my uh, internal budgeting decisions, you know, I assume there that this client will not be there. You know, uh, when I look at our, you know, our future expenses, etc. And then, yes, and when the client left us three, three months later, it actually was a non-event because I completely expected that to happen. And when that happened, it did not sting. You know, it was not, you know. So that's a one way. So the one way you can use negative visualization to prepare for the future, you know, so that's when, you know, kind of, uh, so when bad things happen to you, you know, you kind of expect them to happen, so it's not going to hurt as much. But another way you can do this is they can help you to realize that uh, a couple more things, um, so that uh, what's happening to you is not as bad as you as you make it out to be. Okay, I'll give you one example. I went, you know, we went to Mexico and I bought a uh, we bought a hotel room that was supposed to have an ocean view. We get there, obviously, there was no ocean view. And, you know, and I realized there was absolutely nothing I can do. They, they already were sold out. There was no ocean views available. And I realized that it's such a not a big deal because I could have been in Ukraine or I could have been in Africa. I'm in Mexico in an all-inclusive resort. And the worst thing that happened to me at this point is that 
when I wake up in the morning, I may have to walk three minutes to see the ocean. <laughs> not so, What's the not big so deal? Bad, so so bad. that's that's another way to look at it, right? But then there is a third way to look at negative visualization. And that is basically to appreciate how like it's a almost brings scarcity to life, which is a very important concept to me. So I'll give you a couple examples. Um, when when you have young kids, you think they will they will stay young forever, and you'll be spending a lot of time with them. But what happens after they leave your house, when they are eighteen, you discover that you probably spend ninety five percent or even more of your time with them when they were at home. My son, who is twenty one, who is uh, at university, you know, and I get I'm lucky if I see him three hours a week you know i'm lucky when uh, when he was little i, I would you know, i would see him you know, when he stayed at home i would see him six you know six seven hours a day so um and when he gets married i will see him probably three hours a month so um the reason it's important once you realize this that your kids will not stay young forever you're going to start spending your time with them differently so one simple example my middle daughter is 16 and she will in two years she'll be out of the house so in the past when i drove her to school i look at that as a chore now i reframed it which is one of the story concepts and i look at that as this incredible opportunity i only have 400 or 350 more days then i'll be driving her to school so when i'm there with her in the car i actually i'm there with her i'm paying attention i'm present and I look at that as a gift. That's that's a finite gift. Because again, in two years, so she should go to college and I'll be able to, to, to see her a few hours a week if I'm lucky. So this is basically kind of the applications of, you know, several applications of negative, uh, negative visualization. Yes, it's having some acceptance, thinking ahead towards the future and allowing us to value what we have now before it's gone or before circumstances change. Yes. You also write in your book, about the possibility of having six months to live. Would we live our lives differently? This is something that you've reflected on as well. By the way, anybody who listens to this podcast, after you're done listening to this, I highly encourage you to do you know, one of two things, maybe both. Go in YouTube and look for a video, uh, Last Lecture with Randy Posh, or read his book called Also Last Lecture. So Randy Posh was a professor at, uh, I think at Cornell University. And he was, when he was 45 or 46, he was diag diagnosed with cancer. Uh, I think it was a pancreatic cancer. And he only had six months to leave. So he gives this lecture where he's basically, with the time when he was giving lecture, he was very, like physically, he was completely healthy. He, on stage at university, he did 30 push-ups to demonstrate that he had all the physical health at this point in time. But he had this cancer that was growing rapidly. And he knew that he only has six months to live. And therefore, when he was writing this book or giving this lecture, he was sharing us all these ideas that he had learned over his lifetime. But in his book, he tells the story that had a huge impact on me. And, and this, here's how the story goes. He bought a brand new convertible. Um, and uh, he, at the time he didn't have kids and he came to pick up his uh, niece and nephew to take him to amusement park. His sister sees that he just bought this brand new convertible and, sh and, he, and she tells uh, her kids, guys, make sure not to uh, spill anything in the car. Make sure you know it's clean because it's a Ryan, Uncle Randy's new car. And while she's saying all this, Randy, opens a can of Coke, and while looking at his sister, pours that can of Coke on the back seat of his car. His sister is completely bewildered and shocked. And Randy says, this is just a car. It's just a thing. And, um, and so the interesting part about this, let me give you additional context to this. Actually, this story actually happened before Randy had cancer. That that is how he approached life. You know, this car is just a thing. Now, what I wanted to think about. So this story happened 20 years ago. Okay, 
where is this car today? So Randy passed away 10 years ago, 10, 12 years ago. Where is this car today? It's probably in somebody's in some kind of junkyard, right? Mm -hmm. What does it really matter if it has clean seats or you know, or, you know, or it's or if they're not clean anymore? It doesn't. And that's what happens to a lot of you know things are things. They uh, at some point they will end up in junkyards. They will be thrown away. So once you put you know, once you so the point of the story is this: if you only had six time to live. Would you actually care about if your car has a scratch, if the car your car has uh, a dirty back seats or clean back seats, etc.? Once you look at the, at life from this perspective, you suddenly start paying paying a lot more attention to relationship, and things like scratches on your car will become just little things that you can completely ignore. And that's kind of that's a that's my perspective now. How would I behave whenever I, I face a problem like this? I ask myself, if I had six months to live, would I still be, would I still care about this material things the same way? Yes, and the classic Stoic writers talk about the folly of procrastination. That people will say, "Oh, I want to get to this, I want to do that," but life can really speed by before we realize it. Oh, well, maybe I want to go on this vacation. Oh, I want to learn this skill in my 20s, but then that never happens. And now your 40s, 50s, and all the time just flew by. Yeah, I think the Stoics look at it as they, like you're not 45 years, 45 years old, you're 45 years dead. So like they, you know, they, it's, they, they basically look at the, what you lived is, is that's the time where it died. So yes, so that's, that's exactly how they look at it. Yes, and then later in life, people don't get to do what they wanted to do so they put it off so much so this urgency the stoic writers focus on could be very important it can propel us to action rather than just procrastinating procrastinating and then we never get to accomplish what we wanted to do yeah no i think the what happens to a lot of us is that we think the life will begin in the future the guy life will begin when we retire yeah so maybe we never even make it to retirement either we could always have that's, a sudden right. end. I mean, you could, I could be driving to Wharton home today and get hit by you and get in a car accident. That that was my last day today. So if you approach, if you look at life from this perspective, then you're gonna let me let me run this actually. Just let me run this. Give you two analogies, two fr mental frameworks. I didn't discuss them in my book, but I'm something I'm working on right now. So that's it. That may that may help to kind of to highlight this concept even better. How's that? Okay. Imagine you arrive to a new city. You you wanted to see the city for a long, long time. So you step off the plane, and you're at the airport, which looks just like any other airport. It has white walls, gray carpet, blue, blue, blue seats, seats, and and you have luggage, right? So you, your goal is to basically get to the baggage claim, get the luggage, take Uber. And, get, and goes to the city you want to see. So as you get off the plane, what you're looking for is that baggage baggage claim sign. And as as your eyes basically, you know, as you see the sign, you you follow it, and then and then you go making left, right, you know, going up escalators. You're not noticing anything, but you're just looking for other baggage claim signs, arrows that would take you to baggage claim, right? So while you're walking, you're not paying attention if there are people to the right or to the left of you. If there are stores around you, all you care is about baggage claim signs. Okay, so keep this framework in you know in mind. Let me give you another framework. Now, let's say you go to an art museum, and in my case, you know, and let's see, like I love impressionist uh, 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 artists. So let's see, for us, for me, it would be like Manets and Van Goghs and others. Okay, so I would go to the museum, and at that when I'm in museum. All I care about is just looking at the paintings. And so I look at the one painting, I look at the brush strokes. Time, the past and the future does not exist for me. I'm just in the present. I go from one painting to another. There's an exit sign somewhere at the, at the, at the end of the room and I can see it kind of, you know, in the back of, you know, obviously I can see it, but I'm not paying attention to that. I'm just going from one painting to another and just paying attention to the art, okay? And when I'm done, I'm done. So we can go through life 
if we are at the airport looking back for baggage claim or being present in going through life as we are in the art museum. And the problem is with us, a lot of times we are going through life as most, we spend most of our time as if you want a baggage claim. I'll give you a few examples. When you, like I see a lot of times, you know, I, I work in the office building. I, you know, when I take elevator on Monday and you know, you try to do a small talk with somebody in the elevator and you say, how are you doing? You know, how are you doing? They say, well, it's Monday and that person is waiting until Friday. Right. Yeah. So basically what that person is for, the, for that person, the baggage claim is Friday because for that person, you know, five out of seven days a week, it's just don't exist. He just tries to get through that five days as fast as he's possible, even though that's a 70 percent of his life or whatever the number is, 80 percent of his life. OK. And um, and his life starts on Friday. This we do the same thing with vacations when we are kind of mentally fantasizing about our vacations is that going to happen four or five years from now? I mean, four or five months from now. And why instead of trying to be present in today, in the current moment and noticing life. So I think the Stoics, uh, Stoics probably would, you know, we, you know, we would see that Seneca and Epictetus, Marco Aurelius, they spend a lot less time in the baggage claim mode, a lot more time in the kind of, in the art museum mode. Yes, that, that's an interesting thing. Some people can be hyper focused on one particular area and in work or in general life, unfortunately, some people can be so miserable day to day and they're just waiting for that one thing to happen. Oh, I'm waiting for that weekend. And that, that seems to be a sad place to be. So hopefully stoicism can help us reorient our mental framework and find meaning day to day, find some joy, find some excitement and not just be trudging day to day, just waiting for time to pass by. That's right. Maybe that could be taking some risks and finding a new job, finding a new position, a new way to earn income rather than just doing the same thing over and over again. No, but it's but it's also it's also a little bit more than that. It's also we are keep spending time daydreaming about future things instead of being in the present. Yes, instead of being in the moment and focusing on what's around yes. us now. Yes, it's also you know like it's a I I. I have these practices I do every day, and there, they would be more like uh, <laughs> they would kind of mindful of practices. Like um, when I drink tea in the first cup of tea in the morning, I actually focus on the first cup of tea on that moment. I, you know, I I hold the cup. Like you know, the you know, Japanese Japanese have a Japanese tea ceremony, which could last for 40 minutes or an hour. For me, it lasts two minutes. But when I drink tea in the morning, I try to be present, try to feel the cup of, you know, the cup of tea and the warmth of the cup. I try to smell the tea and that trains me, this little exercise trains me to be present. Also, when I do push-ups in the morning, again, I for this 30 seconds or whatever minute, I try to be present and only, it's almost like, it's, it's almost like meditation basically. It's a kind of mini version of meditation, but it's a just focusing on being present. And, uh, these little things, and you know, obviously, you can't, like, you can't be mindful 100% of the time because if you if you're mindful when you're drinking tea, like when you're drinking or eating all the time, you just, you would not be able to get anything done. Um, but I think it's important for us to kind of do these little exercises, try to stay mindful. Yes, and taking on new challenges, whether it's meditation, as you mentioned in the book, or yeah. whether it's something like swimming or skiing. You've talked about your experiences with both uh, swimming and skiing and introducing that to your family. So can you tell us about that and how that was taking on a new challenge and what good came out of it? Well, I, I found ski. So this is it's kind of interesting. I found skiing was one of the most important things that happened to my oldest son, Jonah. Um, so when he was little, he had asthma. He still has asthma, actually. And so my wife and that was our first child. So my wife was very protective of him. And that kind of protective energy that, you know, that actually unfortunately made him when he was little, when he, would, he, when he was you know, six or eight, or nine years old, was very timid. He was afraid of everything. And so when we went, I, I live in Denver, so we are about two hours away from ski, ski slopes. So, and luckily it's, you know, when we went skiing, my wife doesn't ski. It was just him, just, just two of us on the slopes. And 
he was afraid of skiing. And it took us, uh, I don't know, uh, maybe a week for him to get on the bunny slope, which is the easiest slope there is, almost flat. It took another week for him to take a, a bigger lift to go on a green slope. It was a very treacherous time. But over time, and over time, he got a little bit more self-confident because when he's, you know, when you, once you get on the mountain, you have to get down. Somehow you have to figure this out. And little by little, he would overcome his fears of skiing. And little by little, he became more and more self-confident. Today, he's 21, 21 years old. He's one of the best skiers on the mountain. And, you know, if you talk to him, he would tell you that overcoming his fears when he when he when he's kid that that was a life changing changing experience for him um and i think it's a it sounds horrible but i think just the fact that my wife did not ski was a big positive right because like the as a mother you know she would get her emotions kind of to you know she would be as a mother it's very difficult for her because she would always worry about him and therefore her not being there and just me being, you know, kind of the cold male, I guess. <laughs> um, but her not being there actually was a big plus in this in in this case, in this unique case. Um, and uh, but then but then you find out how different your kids are. My middle daughter, who is Hannah, who is five years younger than Jonah, she had no fear in the world. So when she started skiing, when Jonah. Like, Jonah and her started skiing at the same time. When Jonah was struggling on the bunny slope, Hannah went down this bunny slope, saw a jump, you know, to the left, turned left, went on the jump, and just and she did this because her brother was scared and she wanted to show that she can do it. So you know, just how different kids are. That's all. Good. Yes, and we're not saying take on extreme challenges to start in a pretty reasonable manner. Uh, the bunny slopes and skiing, or maybe, okay, you learn chess, you learn some fundamentals, you learn some opening strategy, you know, you're not just going to go and play the greatest players in the world and get completely crushed, right? Well, you, you build it up, right? Yes, Like yes. with skiing, you, build, you slowly build it up, yes. And to move on to more mindfulness, you write about being mindful of expenses and our wants, that we can be happy with few wants even as our income increases. But sadly, many people's spending goes up as their income increases, and surprise, surprise, they're still not happy. I'll be honest, like if I write another book, it's probably mindfulness is going to appear in that book and then 20 times per page. <laughs> because that's, that's one of the most important concepts for me, like you know, us being mindful when we make decisions. Um, but spending is a decision, right? We spend money you know, multiple times a day, every single day. And that should be a mindful, deliberate decision we can always, no matter how much money we spend we make we can always spend more you don't believe me think about how many celebrities who made 10 mil, tens of millions of dollars a year went bankrupt yep so having a lot of money is not enough you also have to be mindful how you spend it and so what i would argue is that one thing you can do is come up with a budget like or just look at your expenses you know they just Make it simple. Look at what your expenses. Look at your credit card statement or bank statement, and just put in different categories how much money you spend on food, clothes, uh, your mortgage. But don't stop there because you also have expenses that happen. They don't happen every month, but they happen every so often. Uh, every so many years, you need to buy a car. Uh, at some point in the future, you retire and you. Maybe able to, you have a low income, so you need to have some savings for that. Uh, you know, if every so many years you're going to get in a car accident, then you have a deductible for your car insurance, so you need to have a kind of emergency fund. So you identify these expenses. Like let's say, if you like, give an example with a car, if you change if you change cars every five years, you mean you may figure out that you need to spend two hundred dollars a month, put away two hundred dollars a month, so when in five years comes. You can buy that car with your savings. Okay, so you identify all these expenses. And then ask yourself a question. Like try to categorize them. Which, one are, which ones are more important to you? Which ones aren't? Some of them obviously are more or less uh, fixed expenses. Like uh, if, you have a, if you have a health insurance, that's not going to change. Or, but you can also make, you can make an adjustment how much you pay for, you know, for, for your rent, etc. cetera, uh, by moving to different houses, et cetera. But anyway, so the you you identify your expenses and then you ask yourself a question. 
uh, which one is more important to you? To you is that that 1,500 hours you spend a year on Chipotle, or 1,500 hours a year that you spend on uh, Starbucks, or you find that maybe uh, if you maybe more it's more important to you to travel, and that if you forego Chipotle and Starbucks, then maybe you can afford an extra vacation a year. So once you start looking mindfully looking at your expenses, you realize that money buys the most when it buys things you value. So you may decide that okay, I'll forego this Chipotle, or maybe I'll go to Chipotle, you know, once a week instead of five times uh, f- five days a week, and I'll completely I'll start you know drinking coffee at work, and by doing this, I'll go on vacation more. So you start, you know, so, so you know, and therefore that vacation, that whatever two or three thousand hours that you spend on vacation, buys you a lot more than that f- the same amount of money was buying you when you were buying things that didn't matter to you as much. Yes, and with traditional jobs, and even if we're to make income in non-traditional ways, I look at it and think, okay, hey, I traded my time for money to some extent. So is it really worth spending forty-five dollars for that fancy bottle of wine? Like, could I really do without that? Uh, I could see budgeting for certain entertainment or certain pleasures in life, but but I've been more attracted to the frugal life as of late, as of recent years, and just saying, hey, well, if I can have more money behind, then that's more peace of mind for those upcoming expenses, and then more time to do the things that I like to do. If I'm buying less stuff, and I'm not buying a brand new car, and I'm not buying these designer jeans, right, I, I can be happy with less, and I think I'm better off for it. Yeah, I think money does. Like, what 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 I found that money doesn't really buy happiness. What money does do, gives you choices, and also when you have a when you have savings, it also reduces volatility. You know, you just start worrying less about money. If you if you are mindful about your spending, if you have some savings, if you lose a job, you don't have to worry about well, how am I going to pay for mortgage tomorrow. If you have some if you have some savings, so you know money. It's not. It's you know. It does not. It really does not bring happiness, but it it could reduce a lot of uh, anxiety from your life. Yeah, and it, it seems to have diminishing value as well. As if we're someone maybe very low income, living on maybe Section Eight housing or living with family members. Okay, well, an extra ten thousand is going to mean a lot more for that kind of person versus a person who's maybe salary and making like eighty thousand a year. So at some point, that that money doesn't have as much value. You know, actually, I just realized, uh, I remember this, uh, it, I think it's, a, uh, I, f- I forget where I heard this, but this is a, this is combination of, so this combines money and negative visualization at the same time. So this guy comes to uh, either pastor or rabbi, whoever you want to, you know, chose and says, you know what, I just, I live in this apartment with my wife, your mother, four kids, and there's also, you know, my, my wife's brother lives with and it's a two bedroom or three bedroom apartment. And just, it's very difficult to live there. He's like, you know what? Do this. Bring, ch- you know, and this is, I guess, it's happening on the farm. He's like, bring your chickens. Uh, and you know, bring your chicken in, in house. The guy said, okay. So he comes back in a week and says, yeah, I brought chickens. How's that? He's like, well, the life is, you know, just got worse. He's like, well, bring, now bring a cow. And he keeps going like this, you know, bring all these farm animals into the house, right? And then, you know, a few months goes by and he comes back to this uh, rabbi and rabbi says, now take the, all the farmed animals out of the house. And uh, as the, and, the and, then tell, and come back to me and tell me how your life is. And, the, and so the guy took all the farm animals out of the house, comes back and he says, rabbi, my life is so, so great now. So I think that's, that's the thing. So a lot of times we... You know, we, if you, this is like a, this is a great example of negative visualization because if you if you realize like if you look at Americans today, our houses are bigger now than ever before. We have a whole bunch of junk in the houses, and if you look at the houses we lived, I don't know, 50 years ago, they were just a fraction of our size. And a lot of times, if you just get rid of all the extra junk you have in your houses, then your life is going to be just so much better. And uh, and you won't need as much space, actually. Yeah, so to be mindful of, of what we have and having moderation, too. I'm not saying live in squalor, don't own anything, of course. Stoicism is calling for moderation and mindfulness and 
what we own and how we use money. They're not seeing money as a good thing or a bad thing, but rather how we use it is the prime concern. You also mention in your book that Stoicism often has a flawed public understanding of someone who's being emotionless, maybe like a statue, but Stoicism is instead about recognizing emotions and trying to lessen or transform our negative emotions that we might have. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, I think the word Stoic to a lot of people means, with a capital S, means a, you know, a person who is non-emotional, right? And I think obviously Stoics were emotional, but I think a lot of the, this concept of framing, like Stoics have this concept of framing. A lot of times things that happen to us, we choose to frame it as negative, where they, are, they could be neutral. Um, when you lose a job, you can frame it as negative, or you can frame it as an opportunity to find a better job. When, the, when you are at the grocery store and the, and the grocery clerk is rude to you, you can look at it, first of all, the, the fact that you know, the word the rude, you know, the, the fact that I just can't categorize it as rude, that's already me framing it as rude. Or those are just words that came out of somebody's mouth. You know, those words don't come and hit you over the head. They are just sounds, right? So we we choose to frame them as negative. You know, that's number one. Number two, you can also look at it as an opportunity for for a stoic test. It's for you to see if how you're going to, you know, that you don't have to, you can reframe it as in being neutral. Also, you can realize that this is a, you know, this person is literally external, right? Because you can't control how, you, you can't expect to go through life and expect that every single interaction you're going to have with a stranger is going to be a positive one. But what you can control, the internal part, is how you react to it. Mm -hmm. So, now, you're, once you focus on how you react to it, then you suddenly realize that, well, the person says something negative to me, but I chose, I chose to ignore it. Um, so what Stoic, what Stoic philosophy really does, as I mentioned before, it helps you to reduce the uh, volatility of your negative emotions. And by doing it, it's almost like it makes your life just calmer. Yes, and to try to give a fair interpretation for what's happening around us and having a realistic perspective that, okay, well, er not everyone is going to be a very likable person. It's like Epictetus wrote of someone who was in a gymnasium that maybe you're running around and someone bumps into you. Well, maybe it was intentional, maybe not. Maybe the person wasn't paying attention. There can be all different ways to interpret it. So let's try to have a realistic interpretation and not just jump to conclusions about the worst things possible, that people are always out to get us that life is unfair, like life, life just is and things are happening. So what are we going to do with those events around us? How are we to understand things? Uh, that's absolutely right. And hopefully not to become negative as well. Like, okay, we might see negativity around us, but oh, just because society isn't going the way that I want it to, then therefore I'm going to tear it all down. That's certainly not going to help things either. Yeah, I think good, good thoughts bring you happiness and that's so it's poisoning you with anxiety and pain, right? So, and you are, and this is where actually meditation becomes very useful, right? Because one, I look, meditation is a tool. It's not a, it's not a magic wand that's going to solve all your problems. But what meditation allows you to do is helps you to observe your own thoughts. Okay, it's kind of being a third party to your own thoughts. And when you observe your thoughts and you observe a negative thought inside your mind, then by observing it, you're actually neutralizing the thought. And also, or you give an opportunity for you to reframe the thought. Um, so I think this is why I think I'm a huge fan of meditation and mindfulness in general. Uh, so that, you know, like, uh, the, you, know, it's a, you know, if you take meditation and combine it with stoicism, I think it's a very powerful combination. You wrote, the more we tie happiness to things outside of our control, the more we subject ourselves to negative volatility of the outside yeah. world. Got it. Yeah, so it's, this is like, this is, brings us back to the academy of control, right? Because the, the, like, that, the, let's talk about the academy of control, because I mentioned it a few times. But you have things that are internal and external. Things that are internal to us that are under our control is basically, it's our values, it's our behavior, it's you know, the, it's it's our you know, it's basically our reaction to things, and everything else is not under our control. 
if the uh, grocery store uh, clerk is with you, not under your control. When you're driving to work and every light you hit is a red light, I'm not under your control. If you lose your job, it's not under your control. So once you, so therefore what you want to do, you want to set your goals and your goal, you want your goals to be uh, process-based with, very, with relatively sh uh, short feedback loop. And this way you are focusing on things you can control. I'll give you an example. Um, you're studying for a test, like you have a test. So your goal should not be to get an A on the test. Your goal should be to do the best job you can prepare for the test and to be as ready as possible on this test, uh, for, for this test. Now, with the grade you get on the test, it's not under your control because you you may not, even, you know, because you don't know how you're going to feel at that moment in time when you're taking the test. You don't know the questions that are going to be on the test. And, uh, and if your goals are process-based, then you're not tying yourself, you know, to uh, to the roller coaster, of, you know, uh, which you have little control over. Yes. So to have a more process-based rather than results-based orientation, as Stoics would talk about, maybe an archer. An archer can do his due diligence and looking at the target, readying the bow. But a lot of things can happen from when that arrow is released before the arrow gets to the target. Maybe there can be a sudden gust of wind, right? We can take aim, and that's that's what we should aim yeah. to do in life, right? We try to make the best effort we can to be diligent and to work towards goals. But yes, recognize what's inside and outside of our control. Even in your book, you mentioned that there's a little bit of um, a third area that was talked about of some things that are partially inside our control and partially outside of our control. That's right. And this, in this example, the, you know, what's, what's in your control is not the grade you're going to get in the exam, but how well you study for it, right? And as an archer, you know, like how it's a, you know, it's the practice, you know, the practice, and uh, that's under your control. And it's also actually very difficult, but it's something we should always try to uh, aspire to do is once the bow, like as an archer, once the bow lives, you know, well, once you, you know, once you, once you, you know, made the shot, and let's take, let's say, let's say you slow down time, and it takes. Like actually not caring, stop caring if you're gonna hit the target or not, right? So like uh, in the in the book I talk about how when, um, I'm a chartered financial analyst, and that was a, such a treacherous three years of my life because it's like CPA and steroids because you study <laughs> for you study for four months uh, by yourself, then you take a test, and you find out two months later if you pass the test. If you failed you have to take over the test again a year later. And and the material will be slightly different. So the you have to study all over again. And I remember when I would took I would, I would take an exam in early June and actually late July, early August you get the result. And I was mugging a mailman literally from uh, you know, from mid July to early August. And because I was so anxious about the result. What I should have like what what I should have done at that point at that point in time, I should have spent as much time, you know, done the best job preparing for the exam as possible, which I did. And once I took the test, I should have just let it go. Again, it's a easier said than done. But that's something. What's great about Stoicism? It's a Stoic philosophy. It's we call it Stoic philosophy. I think it's actually we should call it differently. We should call it Stoic practice, because it's really practice. You know, it's a, again, as I mentioned, knowing philosophy but not doing it is almost not knowing. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so we should practice this. And whenever you know, this this happened 25 years ago. But what I should have done then is that whenever the thought about the exam you know came to me, I should have just noticed that and dismissed it, and just focused on something else. And that's something we can. If we do this enough, we'll be able to rewire our our brain, basically, but not pay attention that are not under control. Yes, and unfortunately, some people can get in a miserable state of like, oh, I, I can't get this um, 
ideal partner in life or, oh, I'm not able to make money as much as my neighbor or, oh, I don't look a certain way. And some people can get into um, a miserable state and think, oh, it's over for me that I haven't accomplished A, B and C, especially things that are outside of your control. Therefore, there's lack of meaning in life. People can get into a nihilistic state. No, I, I think that I think that's right. And I think we should be very careful with external comparisons because there's a lot of people who have hundreds of millions of dollars and they feel miserable because they have friends who have billions of dollars. Okay, so whenever you, yeah, so the, you have to be very careful um, with this external comparisons. And I, in the book I talk about this, I have this chapter, which is, I'm going to mention the name of the chapter because I love, I thought it was very funny, the name of it, is that it's called Go Ahead, Covet Your Neighbor's Wife. Mm-hmm. I, you know, I just, <laughs> and there was a Jew, actually it's a Jewish wis- wisdom, where it basically says whenever you envy somebody, you should not just envy part of what that person has, but envy the person in the entirety. Okay, this sounds kind of horrible on the surface, but let me give you an example. It's gonna make you, it's gonna make sense. Um, let's say you have a neighbor, and that neighbor has a beautiful wife. You know, I, one of the Ten Commandments says, don't covet your neighbor's wife. And I say, go ahead and covet your neighbor's wife. Except do it holistically. Don't just stop of how, for, but, you know, don't just stop with your looks. But also embrace other sides that she has. Maybe this person spends two hours a, a day, I, you know, uh, uh, you know putting on makeup. Maybe this, you know, maybe this, you know, this person has a, bro- you know, has a brother who spends six months a year in jail, you have to bail him out all the time. Maybe <laughs> her mother maybe insists to kissing your lips every time you see her. Okay. So once you once you kind of don't just focus on her looks in this case, maybe she has a horrible personality, right? Um, once you look at it holistically, you realize actually I may not want it. Right. So because as a whole package, as a whole package, you may not want to uh, be with that person. Um, a lot of times we look at wealthy people and we want their wealth, but we don't realize that to get to this wealth, they had to make huge sacrifices. I'm a value investor, so I go to Berkshire Hathaway every year, and I've been going to uh, Warren Buffett's annual meetings uh, for the last 12 or 13 years. But I, I tell you, when I look at Warren Buffett, he's a role model for me in many ways, but I don't want to have his wealth, and here's why. Because to get to this wealth, Warren, you know, Warren Buffett basically neglected his children, you know, and his wife. You know, his you know, first wife left him because he was so focused on investing that he completely neglected her. He, you know, and he loved his wife dearly. He was completely devastated when she left him. His kids, he completely neglected them again for the same reason. So, do I really want to have a hundred billion dollars or whatever Warren Buffett has, and ne- neglect my family? No. You know, that's my kind of view of the world. So if you don't just, if you covet something, just do it, cover the whole package. And this way you may decide not to cover it at all. Yes, perhaps the grass isn't always greener on the other side, that maybe there are societal cultural messages that say, oh, well, life should be this way. You should aspire towards these certain things. Or there's family pressure of, oh, well, hey, I was a dentist, so you should be a dentist too. But Maybe there's not a one-size-fits-all kind of thing. There could, there could be a lot of directions we go in, and we could find meaning, we could find fulfillment in many different ways, not just one path that someone else is putting out for us. I heard this expression. Uh, if I, I'm going to apologize for my language ahead of time. But uh, the grass, a lot of times, it's uh, fertilized with bullshit. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yep. Yeah, as, uh, even in the Stoic texts, there's talk about, well, you have this idea of being a husband, but are you prepared for what that takes on? And are you going to have to use your time towards uh, familial duties rather than being out in society, helping others? It's a lot of responsibility, right? So there, there are all sorts of trade-offs in life. And maybe we think something is going to be great for us. How many people started college pursuing a certain degree and then two years later they find out, oh no, I didn't really like this or they get the job and then the job wasn't so great and they end up going in a different direction. I think that's right. And I think the, my kids want to have a dog. And I am, I basically explain them that getting a dog is, sounds very exciting, but think about how many other things you have to do when you have a dog. You have to walk them every day. 
you have to poop up. You know, I mean, you have to pick up all the excrements uh, the dog produces. It, it, it comes with, you know, just focusing on the pleasure of having a dog and ignoring the responsibility that comes with that, right? That's a, that's a, you know, that's a, just silly, I would argue. So uh, uh, we we have we we dog sitted uh, our friend's dog for a week, and after that, I think my kids decided they don't want to have a dog. All right, very good. We're coming up towards the end of the recording here. Are there additional topics you'd like to discuss or things you'd like to add? Uh, you know, I tell you this. Uh, so since I wrote the book, I like, couldn't really stop writing the book. So it's the book already got published, and since then, I wrote five new chapters. So if you listeners go to soulinthegame.net, they can learn how they can get new chapters, you know, absolutely free that I, you know, that I wrote since the book came out. Oh, great. So that's soulinthegame.net. .net. Yeah. Sorry. Ah, very good. Yes, the .com domain probably taken, but even getting yeah, the .net. Yes, yeah, unfortunately <laughs> it is. Yes, soulinthegame.net. Yes, I wish that that .com was available. Oh, yes. And as you mentioned, that's the title of your book you've mentioned is similar to Nassim Taleb's idea of skin in the game. So can you talk a little bit about that before we wrap up? Yeah, sure. No, so Nassim Taleb, who is one of my favorite thinkers, and by the way, he's endorsed so my book as well wrote this wonderful, wonderful book called Skin in the Game. And in that book, he had a chapter called Soul in the Game. And I, and I, I don't know, when I read it, it felt like it was a throwaway chapter. It was not a very important chapter. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe the same things it was the most important chapter of the book. But, and I read this chapter, and I was blown away by the concept of that. So first of all, let's talk about what's Skin in the Game. Skin in the Game is basically when you share not just the upside with somebody, but also the downside of the decisions as well. So I'll give you an example. Like centuries ago, if you were an engineer and you built a bridge, you know, and you got compensated for that, when the first carriage went through the bridge, you were you stood under the bridge when the first carriage went through that. If the bridge collapses, you share the downside mm-hmm. with, with the person who is driving the carriage. So that's that's what it means having a skin in the game. Soul in the game, it's a kind of next level of skin in the game. It assumes you have skin in the game, but also you the activity you're doing has consumes all of you. Every single ounce of your soul is in this activity. So for me, writing and investing, for instance, I you know, when I when I write or when I invest, it's those activities are very dear to me. And therefore, I would, you know, like if if I got paid one tenth of what I'm getting paid today, I would still be doing what I'm doing. So for me, uh, so for me, you know, so when you have a soul in the game, money is a kind of a second secondary consideration. That's not a primary uh, reason why you do that. Um, also, you if you have soul in the game, you don't compromise on quality. Like, oh, you don't. You would not do anything that would uh, violate your principles. Uh, so those are kind of the kind of that's a that's a yeah, I'm giving it a very you know it's a it's a very important concept and I'm just giving you kind of the highlights of that. But that's what it means to have soul in the game. And I thought this chapter was uh, in the book was so important that I named the book after the chapter. All right, great. And again, that's soul in the game. Dot net where they can find your book and more about you any other ways you'd like people to reach out to you maybe social media email other connections yeah so they have a podcast uh, and it's just basically my articles which is about investing stoics life classical music I read to you so I actually I write the article somebody else reads them to you it's like articles on tape and if you just go and look up intellectual investor and you'll find my podcast uh, and finally if you go to soulinthegame.net, you can also subscribe to get my articles by email. So those are probably the best ways to kind of follow me. All right. Very good. Anything else you'd like to add? That's it. All right. Thank, thank you. you. I, want, I, want, I, want, I want to thank you. Thank you very much. That was, a, that was a great interview. Thank you. All right. Thank you. A very quick hour or so. So thanks to listeners for listening in and check out soulinthegame.net. Thanks for listening and stay tuned for more content. See the show notes for more information and links surrounding topics discussed in this episode. Support my efforts through my Patreon page, found at StoicSolutionsPodcast.com. 
access special perks, including upcoming guests, answering your questions, custom-made podcast episodes, and private one-on-one calls to discuss whatever you'd like. Visit my other podcast at hurdygurdytravel.com. That's H-U-R-D-Y-G-U-R-D-Y travel.com to learn how to make money, save money, and travel the world at next to no cost with credit card rewards, deals, and loyalty programs. Use affiliate or referral links to help support me at no extra cost to you. Thanks to generous patrons and fans of this podcast who help support my work. Have a great day.